Summer camp was approaching, and Nicky Versteppen was still not sure if he really wanted to go or not. The year before, he did not go because he was scared of getting homesick, and his parents supported his decision to stay back home. Nicky Versteppen preferred to spend summers at home in the town of Heibloem, in the south of the Netherlands. That way, he could always go to visit friends, play games with his younger sister, Femme, Kay, or cuddle and love up to his dog. He would always miss his dog any time he left home for the summer camp. In the summer of 1998, even though Nicky Versteppen felt unsure about going to summer camp, he still felt that he had to go. He felt he was not 10 years old anymore. He was 11 years and was growing up. After he told his mother that he was not too sure about summer camp, she encouraged him and said that once he was there, he would have a lot of fun. Since his best friend was going too, Nicky felt everything would be okay. After concluding to go, Nicky Versteppen began to pack his necessities not forgetting to include his favorite red and white pajamas, which was an official merchandise for Affa Kajak, his favorite soccer team from Amsterdam. It was gifted to him as a Christmas present because of his love for anything that had to do with Ajax logo and colors. In fact, most of Nicky Versteppen's room was designed with everything Ajax from color red to white. The day of summer camp came and Nicky picked up his bag, looked at his room for the last time and left. Sadly, he would never get to see the poster of Jerry Litmanen hanging against the wall of his room ever again. Nicky Verstappen was born on the 13th of March 1987 to Peter and Berthe Verstappen in Heibloem in the district of Limburg, the Netherlands. He had a loving family and was the eldest of two children. Nicky and his younger sister, Femke, loved to play together. Nicky, who lived in a small community of 800 people, would frequently cycle all over his hometown of High Bloom. This made many people know him. He was described as friendly and a laid-back young kid. He was also known to be a happy and well-adjusted young man. His mother described him as spontaneous and sporty. At the time, when people think of Nicky Versteppen, it was hard not to recollect the Amsterdam soccer team. Ajax, Nicky was practically a die-hard fan who would never miss a match. Nicky was said to have played soccer himself, and he also was known to be a good player. The annual summer camp for the 8 to 12 years olds came, and on Saturday, the 8th of August 1998, Nicky Versteppen and 36 other schoolchildren from his school took the bus on a 45-minute journey from Heblum to the town of Brunsum in order to take part in the children's summer camp being held on the D High Cop camping grounds on the Brunsum Hyde. It was known that every kid from Heibloem had the opportunity to attend this summer camp every year. Nicky Versteppen, who had encouraged himself to go because of his best friend, got a bit disappointed when his best friend pulled out and decided to stay back home at the last minute. Nicky, however, decided to still go for the summer camp. He stayed on the bus as he waved his friend goodbye. On arrival at the De Hycop camping grounds, the children were divided into their various tent groups. All 37 kids were split into 10 tents, while the four remaining tents were shared among the 12 camp leaders. According to camp tradition, each group had to name their tents. The name was also the name of their team. Nicky Versteppen's tent, which he shared with four other boys his age who were his friends, was named Night Riders. Just like his mother promised, the first day of summer camp was a lot of fun with games and team building activities. Later that night, they all gathered around a campfire while one of the leaders narrated scary ghost stories. Around 10 p.m., the kids were sent to bed while the camp leaders stayed up until midnight eating and drinking. Summer camp started off on a great path. Everyone retired to their tents for the night, feeling happy with the anticipation of a more exciting day, as there were a lot of fun-filling activities planned for the following day. Around 5 a.m. on the 10th of August 1998, one of Nicky Versteppen's tent mate woke up to go use the toilet. At that time, the remaining tent mates, including Nicky, were still sleeping. Around 6 a.m., another kid from the Night Rider's tent woke up and realized Nicky Versteppen was gone. Their initial thoughts was that he had gone to the toilet. However, 
two hours later, at 8 a.m., when the trumpet for breakfast time was played and Nicky had not still returned, his tentmates became worried. They then told their camp leaders that Nicky had gone out of their tent since 6 a.m. and had not returned. Everyone at the campsite, including the campers and camp leaders, started looking for Nicky Versteppen all over the campsite. They searched for him and called out his name numerous times, but he could not be found. Since Nicky Versteppen had been unsure of coming to summer camp, the leaders thought that he had ran away. His parents in Hybloem were then called and told that he had disappeared from the campsite and his whereabouts could not be located. This came as a shock to Nicky's parents. His mother, Berthy Verstappen, sensed something was wrong. To her, she knows her son would never opt and leave the camp without informing anyone since he was quite nervous about going away from home in the first place. It did not make any sense that he would go off on his own. Berthy and Peter then quickly left Hybelum and traveled down to the campsite to look for their son. When they got to the campsite, Berthy noticed that Nicky's shoes were still in the tent. She felt if he had planned to run away, definitely he would have worn his shoes. Nicky's parents then joined the camp leaders to search all over the campsite, desperately calling Nicky's name, but unfortunately there was no answer. By midday, they came to a conclusion to call in the police. Later that afternoon, the search party had grown significantly. There was a massive turnout of volunteers which were mostly friends and family from Heblum, as well as from the local town of Brunsum. They took turns to wait at Nicky's tent and to go out and look for Nicky in the surrounding bushes and fields. The search party frantically looked for Nicky. The police, to a great extent, interrogated all the camp leaders and went to all the homes surrounding the campsite to ask if residents had maybe come across an 11-year-old boy, but it didn't yield anything. Even though Nicky's family insisted that something was seriously wrong, the search party had no real sense of panic. The only general feeling they had was that Nicky Versteppen had left the campsite by himself and had got lost in the woods. They believed he was okay and were expecting him to be found alive and well. The day of the search appeared to have been one of the hottest days of the whole summer of 1998. It was 95 degrees and it made the search even more exhausting. Camp leaders took turns to look for Nicky, while others kept the kids at the campsite occupied with activities. In the evening, armed forces were contacted to join in the search, while the kids were sent to their tents like nothing happened. While they slept, the military vehicles and searchers frantically called out Nicky's name into the darkness of the night. By the next morning, on Tuesday, Nicky was still nowhere to be found, so the camp leaders felt there was no need for camping anymore if one of them was lost. They then decided to cancel the camp. Every kid was placed in a bus and taken back home to Hybelem, while the search party intensified their search efforts. The more they searched for Nicky Versteppen, the more it became clear that he didn't run away. The police used their dogs for the search as well, and an aerial search of the campsite was done using a plane. All efforts to find Nicky yielded no results and by sunset, the search party was running out of daylight. Finally, around 9pm on Tuesday the 11th of August 1998, Nicky Versteppen's uncle, who was part of the search party, noticed something laying underneath a small pine tree. On getting closer, he saw the lifeless body of 11-year-old Nicky Verstappen. Nicky was found in a pine grove on the Schinwelderweg in Landgraf, less than a mile away from the campsite. He was wearing his red Ajax pajama pants and blue underpants and was naked from the waist up. His pajamas pants, which he got as a Christmas present from the previous year, were turned inside out and the front was placed to the back. Nicky had sustained a wound to his head, but at first glance, the wound did not look serious enough to have caused his death. Even though he was found in a pine grove, close to farmlands and bushes, Nicky's feet were clean. He seemed like he did not walk to the place where he was found. People believed that he was killed somewhere else and his body was carried down to the place he was found. The spot Nicky Versteppen was found was near a parking lot that was known for where homosexual men would meet for secret sex. Aside that, Movement around that area was limited. By midnight, 
Nikki Verstepen's body was taken to a mortuary in Mastiak, about 30 minutes away from the campsite. The people of Hybloem came together to assist Nikki's family in arranging a memorial service for him. The memorial service took place at Hybloem Sports Fields on Saturday, the 15th of August, 1998, a week after he left home for summer camp. Since Nikki was wildly known in Hybloem, 600 people attended his funeral. His love for Ajax was recognized at his funeral. His coffin was covered with the red Ajax flag, which was something he would have loved. His family would never remain the same again as they were left in a state of shock and grief. Nikki's parents felt guilty for encouraging their son to go for summer camp even when he confided in them that he was unsure of the trip. Who killed Nikki Verstappen? His family wanted answers and closure. Somebody needed to be held accountable for killing their son and brother, but the police had no leads whatsoever. Seeing that it was unlikely for Nikki to have gone off with a stranger, the police interviewed the camp leaders again. Unfortunately, nothing that could help solve the case was discovered. Nikki's post-mortem examination took place three days after his death. Since he was murdered in the summer of the holiday period, Nikki's family had to wait for two months before the results of the autopsy was released. According to the autopsy report, Nikki Versteppen was drugged and his body showed signs of sexual abuse. However, medical examiner was unable to determine a cause of death. Due to this, a second autopsy was carried out and its result had the same conclusion with the first. There was a possibility that Nikki was sexually assaulted, but his cause of death could not be determined. Even though suffocation was suggested as his cause of death, there was not enough evidence to prove it once and for all. Following Nikki's murder, an extensive investigation was carried out, but the case went cold and would remain unsolved for 20 years. The police had to use the evidence they have. Close to the parking lot, about 100 yards from where Nikki Versteppen was found, a tissue containing semen, a cigarette butt and beer bottle top were retrieved. The forensics then compiled a DNA profile of a person other than Nikki. Though it was not definite that the tissue was related to Nikki's murder case, since people often met in the parking lot and have sex in the woods. In 1997, a year before Nikki Versteppen's murder, a DNA database was created at the National Forensics Institute of the Netherlands. At the time, DNA testing was the new forensic technology and tests were a little bit restricted. Also, any DNA testing on the database could only be handled by the prosecutor and not the police. At that time, the police did not have their own database and they did not have first-hand access to the national database without an approval from the prosecutor. This made the process of quickly finding a killer somewhat slow and difficult. During the investigation of Nikki Versteppen's murder, DNA samples of 40 men were taken. The men included camp leaders, some men from a campsite nearby and other male visitors in the area at the time of Nikki's death. However, none of the DNA matched the profile found in the tissue at the crime scene. Even if the retrieved tissue with semen was probably a leftover of a sexual encounter that had nothing to do with Nikki's death, the investigators still could not strike out the evidence. Later in the investigation, there was a glimmer of hope when a single hair, similar in color to that of Nikki's, was found in the trunk of a car which belonged to one of the camp leaders. After the hair sample was sent to the UK for DNA testing, it was however discovered that it did not belong to Nikki. Immediately, the autopsy results were out. The first person of interest was Joe Barton, an 80-year-old founder of the camp Nikki and his classmates went. Joe Barton was the former principal of Nikki's school in High Blame. He had lost his job after he was convicted of child sexual abuse in the 1950s. During interrogation, he had also confessed that he was near Nikki Versteppen's tent at 6 a.m on the morning of his disappearance, but he did not go there for Nikki. He said he went there to check on one of the boys who had burned his hand the night before. Juice Barton alibi was that when he woke up at 5 a.m., he cleaned his tent and then went to check on the boy who burned his hand, after which he then drove back to Hebloem to attend the funeral of a friend who had died. 
He claimed to have heard about Nikki Versteppen's disappearance at the funeral and went straight back to the camp. Jew Spartan was on the police radar for some time, and this was because he exhibited strange behavior during the search for Nikki Versteppen. He kept steering the search in the direction of the place where Nikki's body was found. He also gave the information that the parking lot near the crime scene was a place where men often meet for sex. The police was uncomfortable about Juice Barton. They decided to look into his background. Even though he was a respected member of his community, he had been convicted for child sexual assault and was imprisoned for three months before he was let go and allowed to work with kids again. Several years later, photos of young boys who were shirtless or in their underpants were discovered on him, though there were no proofs that he further molested any male child at the time. However, after Nikki Versteppen's death, a 15-year-old girl came forward and said that she had every reason to believe Juice Barton had sexually molested her when she attended summer camp earlier that year in 1998. She claimed she was unwell one evening and Juice Barton had given her medication that turned out to be sleeping drugs for adults. She said when she woke up, her clothes were messy and different from the way they were when she went to bed. The girl also claimed to have experienced lower abdominal pain and discomfort. The police, however, could not do anything about her confession since she did not report the incident earlier. After much interrogation, Juice Barton could not be arrested due to lack of sufficient evidence to pin him to the kidnapping and murder of Nikki Versteppen. A reward of 250,000 guilders was offered for any lead that could bring the suspect to justice. As time went, Nikki's family became frustrated as they sensed lack of urgency in solving their son's murder. They resorted to a well-known television crime reporter at the time, Peter Davries, and asked him to help them to solve the mystery surrounding their son's death. Peter Davries agreed to help them look into the case. Over the years, his involvement in the case turned out to be a salvation for Nikki's family. Peter DeVries launched a campaign on behalf of the Versteppen's family, and the reward money was doubled to 500,000 guilders by unknown business people. In April 1999, the first in-depth documentary about Nikki's murder case was broadcast nationally. The documentary talked about Juice Barton's child sexual assault in the past. It brought up questions like, why was he allowed to work with children after being a convicted sex offender? The documentary seemed to put pressure on the police to investigate Juice Barton further. This divided the small community of Hybloem. Nikki's case threatened to tear the community apart. While some people wanted to protect the founder of the camp, some people supported Nikki's family in their quest to find out the truth, even if it meant asking confronting questions. As time went by, majority of the people in Hybloem chose to stay away from Nikki's family. They believed the Versteppens were out on a witch hunt. Nikki's family only held on to a handful of faithful friends who supported them through the case. In July of 1999, Nikki Versteppens' case was ruled unsolved. The next month, in August, Berthy and Peter Versteppen had an opportunity to meet with Queen Beatrix, the former Queen of the Netherlands. They handed her a letter which was an official complaint about the slow investigation in the death of their son. Due to this, efforts were subsequently intensified by the prosecutor in Maastricht to solving the case. In 2001, Nikki's grandparents and the town of Brunsum silently built a monument for Nikki at the spot where his body was found. This didn't make Nikki's parents feel any better. His mother, Berthy, would always light a candle in their family home every morning as soon as she woke up. She did this for 20 years. In an interview with Peter de Vries, she said, I wake up at night and hear his voice. He calls me. I get up and go to look for Nicky, but he is no longer there. Their happy and complete family of four had become an unhappy, incomplete and broken family of three. Since answers were not forthcoming at the time, Berthy, who did not let that stop her, had promised on national TV to bring the killer of her child to justice as long as she was still alive. In February of 2001, Berthy and Peter Versteppen wrote a public letter to the Minister of Justice asking for help on their son's case. They claim to be at the mercy of the police and the legal systems, but they have no answers. 
The legal system then decided to act as there appeared to have been a total breakdown in trust by the people of Heibloem. The general public were getting disappointed at the police and the legal systems for not giving answers as to who killed Nicky Versteppen. In that same year, the case was renewed and a second opinion task force was given the case to investigate from scratch. On the 29th of June 2001, the investigative team was able to determine the time of Nicky's death. His time of death was estimated to have been between 2 p.m. on the 10th of August or 9 a.m. on the 11th of August. It means Nicky Versteppen was alive for at least eight hours before he was murdered. New DNA technology also discovered that there were little drops of blood on Nicky's pajamas. One of the drops was tested for foreign DNA, but it turned out to be that of Nicky. Further investigation revealed many mistakes made by the first set of investigators that made the case become cold for some time. One of the mistakes was that these investigators focused on the scene where Nicky was found. They used that spot as the crime scene forgetting that Nicky's feet were clean when he was found, which suggested that he did not walk to that place himself. He was carried away from the main crime scene and dumped at the spot he was found. The first investigation did not look for possible evidence beyond the pine tree where Nicky was found. Even the campsite where Nicky was last seen was not properly considered for possible clues that could pinpoint the killer. As time unfolds, Jew Spartan was not the only suspects in the case. In 1998, at the time that Nicky and his friends were camping, there appeared to have been another group from the Rolduck Seminary who pitched their tents nearby. A man named Rolduck's chef had piqued the interest of the police, and this was because he had once had an inappropriate contact with a child before. They believed he was someone who would do it again. On the morning of Nicky Versteppen's disappearance, Rolduck's chef was not at the campsite. When questioned, he appeared to have no alibi for his whereabouts at the time. However, he died in 1999 before the police could find enough evidence to arrest him. Also, a man simply known as Wim was another person of interest at the time. Wim was a sex offender from a town nearby. Different witnesses spotted him near De Highcop campsite in a dark-colored vehicle around August 10, 1998. He was questioned by the police in 2001, 2003, 2006 and 2007 any time a witness came forward pointing a finger at him. Unfortunately, there was no sufficient evidence to pin him to the crime, and in 2007, he died at the age of 64. Until his death, Wim had said he never killed Nicky Versteppen. Martin Nee, the German serial killer, was someone the police could not afford to overlook in this case. He had killed three boys and had sexually molested at least 40 children between 1992 and 2001. Martin Ney was known as the masked man or the black man, and this is because he used to wear black clothings and a creepy black mask. His victims were usually hunted by him at campsites or in children's homes. Since De Hecop campsite was located close to the Dutch-German border and one of Ney's proven crimes was committed in the Netherlands, he was considered as a serious suspect. However, when he was eventually arrested for all his crimes in 2001, Martin Ney denied any involvement in Nicky Verstappen's murder. As the investigation progresses, the police had quite a number of suspects on their list. The likes of Michel Fournier and Mark Hoffman, who were sex offenders at the time, were considered suspects to Nicky Verstappen's homicide case, but thorough investigation vindicated them, and they were never charged with his murder. In 2004, Peter de Vries became aware of new testing techniques in the science of DNA. He then informed the public and told the police to re-examine the blood found on Nicky Verstappen's clothing. In 2005, an anonymous person placed letters on Nicky's memorial in Brunsum, claiming to have been responsible for killing him. Investigators traced the letters to a 36-year-old man, but it turned out to be a false confession the man was a psychiatric patient who had severe mental health issues. His therapist explained that he had written the letters as a way of getting attention. The man was placed in custody for two weeks for vandalizing Nicky Versteppen's grave. In 2008, 
When it seemed like all hope was lost, detectives announced that foreign DNA had been found on Nicky's pajamas pants and his underpants. Previous suspects in the case were all retested, but there were still no matches to the DNA found. Nevertheless, Nicky's family was positive. It might seem like another dead end, but the discovery of the foreign DNA profile meant there was proof of a male individual being in physical contact with Nicky Versteppen before his death. Nicky's family prayed and hoped that the perpetrator would be found before he could hurt any other person. In the year 2010, Nicky Versteppen's sister, Femke, who was in her 20s by then, made a public appeal to every man in the community to participate in a DNA testing so that the family could have some sense of closure. After the appeal, the police gathered a list of over 100 men. These men were initially part of the search party and camp management. 80 out of 114 men agreed to provide saliva swabs, even though it was quite a high number of turnouts for the DNA analysis Peter de Vries took to the media again to encourage people to be partakers of the DNA tests. It seemed a lot of these men were scared of leaving their DNA samples because they do not want to be caught for a past crime. However, after Peter de Vries explained that their DNAs would only be used for the Nicky vs. Steppens case, additional 40 men came forward. After carrying out a comprehensive test on the retrieved DNA samples, there was still no match to the DNA found on Nicky's clothing. In a desperate attempt to find the truth, the remains of Juice Barton, who had died in 2003, were exhumed for testing. There was hope at that point since Juice Barton had been the strongest suspect throughout the years. However, many people became surprised when the DNA of Juice Barton did not match the DNA found on Nicky Versteppen's clothes. In the early days of 2012, Nicky Versteppen's homicide case was transferred to a cold case team. The new investigators went through Nicky's case file from the very beginning to end. After that, they located a group of 1,500 males, all of whom had ties to the region near the campsite where Nicky Versteppen was last seen. The individuals on the list were either camp employees, residents of the neighborhood, or officially charged sex offenders. But once again, they were out of luck. The police did not give up easily. They renewed their request for public assistance in 2017. They requested over 20,000 DNA samples in order to perform kinship analysis. By this, investigators would have more information about the killer's relatives, which would greatly reduce the scope of their search. In the long run, only 15,000 volunteers participated. However, the size of this DNA dragnet operation was unprecedented in Dutch history. Given that there was nothing more to be done, it was a long shot, but also the last option. Bulk DNA sweeping is a significant project, and numerous ethical issues have been brought up in relation to it. Most people believe that cooperating was a no-brainer if they had nothing to conceal and their DNA profile may help investigators identify the killer of a young child. Authorities sent mails to all the men requesting new DNA samples. Police would attempt to persuade them to assist if there were no answers from them by visiting them at home. One of the men named Joss Brech, who was supposed to provide a sample, did not show up. Two police officers went to his house, but he wasn't there. The man, according to his relatives, traveled to France in February of 2012 and did not return. Joss Breach's family reported him missing in April. He had vanished from his home and presumably ran away before the police could find him and extract his DNA. Authorities investigated this man's past to learn who he was because they had concerns about him. When Nicky Versteppen was killed, Jos Bresch was 35 years old. He resided in Simpelveld with his mother, which is about 12 miles from the campsite. He was a committed scout member and frequently served as a camp leader as well. He had also spent some years providing childcare in Brunson. He had once been involved in a case of sexual abuse of two 10 years old boys in 1985. Despite making a confession to the crime, he was not found guilty. He only got a two-year probationary period and his name was never added to the list of sex offenders. 
That was why he evaded detection when local police conducted a DNA search of all sex offenders. His name was never mentioned. On August 10, 1998, Joss Bresch was in the immediate area of Nikki's disappearance. Around midnight on Tuesday, August 11, 1998, police stopped him while he was cycling on a road close to the crime site. Few hours before he was seen by the police, Nikki Versteppen's corpse had just been discovered, and at the time the police saw Joss Bresch, Nikki's body was being transported from the campsite to Maastricht for the autopsy. When the cops questioned him about why he was out cycling at that time, Joss Bresch responded that he was delivering letters to scout members because it was too hot to have done so during the day. The explanation seemed reasonable to the officers because that particular day had been very hot. However, when he was questioned later, during investigation, he provided a different explanation. Child pornography was discovered on his personal computer in August 1998 the same month when Nikki Versteppen was murdered. But once again, Joss Bretsch only got a warning. One of the 15,000 DNA samples provided to authorities during the bulk DNA search in 2017 revealed a close match to the foreign DNA found on Nikki Versteppen. The DNA sample belonged to a relative of the individual whose DNA was found on Nikki's clothes. That person happened to be related to the missing Joss Bree. In order to create a DNA profile, police asked Joss Brecker's family if he had left behind a hairbrush or toothbrush as they were getting closer to solving the case. His family assisted the authorities and provided them with some of his personal belongings. Finally, after 20 painful long years, all the effort paid off. At the start of June 2018, the forensics discovered a 100 perfect match between Joe's Brechtedna and the DNA found on Nikki's pajamas and underpants. Detectives were, however, requested to keep the new information to themselves in order to avoid alerting the offender. The investigators now began a massive global search for Joss Breach. Joss Brecht's last known location was in the Vosges mountain region of northern France where he served as a survival expert who guided nature expeditions into the mountains. Keep in mind that he was an experienced scout member who knew what he was doing. When Joss Bresch departed the Vosges, no one knew where he had gone because he had not used his credit cards or his phone. Police discovered that he had improved his survival skills and had made preparations to vanish and live off the grid. His computer search history demonstrated that he was well prepared because he had done extensive study on small towns throughout Europe, places where Dutch news would not be reported. According to law enforcement, the only way to get him out of his hiding spot was to ask the public for assistance. On August 22, 2018, they revealed at a press conference that DNA samples from Jos Breck's personal items matched the DNA discovered on Nixie Versteppen's clothing. They also disclosed his name and current age. Due to privacy laws in the Netherlands and the rule that everyone is considered innocent until proven guilty, it is customary to only use the first letter of a surname. However, this instance was unique because it required assistance from law officials to find Joss Brecht. The public appeal worked because the week following the press conference, a Dutch resident of northern Spain who had seen Joss Brecht's picture in the newspaper recognized him and called the police to report his whereabouts. Joss Brech was living in a tent next to a commune house in the village of Casteltercol, north of Barcelona. Twenty years after Nicky Verstappen's death, on August 26, 2018, Joss Brech was taken into custody. The passport he had with him at the time of his arrest served as proof of his name. He was returned to the Netherlands on September 6, 2018, and appeared in court for the first time in December 2018. Peter de Vries rejoiced with Nicky Verstappen's family following the arrest of Joss Brech. There was a strong feeling of relief and accomplishment. Joss Brech had been questioned in 2001 regarding his presence close to the crime scene on the night Nicky's body was discovered, and he had confessed to child molestation in the past. In his words, he said, Yes, I can imagine why you'd want to speak to me because I have had some brushes with the law in the past, in connection with child abuse. This statement was not followed up on, or a DNA sample taken. 
Joss Brech was not on the sex offenders list, but he had effectively placed himself on it. This case would have been long solved if only the police had thoroughly looked into Joss Breck back then. In December 2018, the trial commenced in Maastricht. Joss Bresch was charged with manslaughter rather than murder. Manslaughter is a less serious charge. There isn't enough evidence to prove that the murder was premeditated, as there would be in a murder case. Joss Brech pled not guilty in court and defended himself saying his DNA was found on Nikki's clothing because when he was walking close to the edge of a forest back at the camp area, he saw something in the distance and went to look out of curiosity, only for him to find Nikki's body. He said that he had checked for signs of life, brushed leaves off the body and then left without any other action because of his previous convictions. However, the prosecutor argued that a total of 27 traces of Joe's Brech's DNA had been found on Nikki's body, including on his underwear. Joss Brech still maintained his innocence, saying he had no idea how his DNA ended up on Nikki's underwear. After trial, Joss Brech was found guilty, and on the 28th of January, 2022, an appeal court convicted him on a charge of manslaughter and sentenced him to 16 years imprisonment. Will Nikki Versteppen's family ever find satisfaction, even though they may have some answers? Their son will always be 11 years old, even as his peers age and progress through life. Every day, they are plagued by countless unanswered questions, such as, would Nikki have grown up to realize his goal of playing professional soccer? They are wounded and they no longer believe in people. Femke Verstappen continues her mother's custom of lighting a candle for Nikki each day and keeping fresh flowers around the house, even though she is an adult with a kid of her own. 911 operators received a terrible phone call in January of 2001. The caller had called to inform them that a young mother named Pamela Shelley had shot and killed herself. After the autopsy had been done, the forensic pathologist determined Pamela Shelley's death to be a suicide. However, neither Pamela's family nor the police believed the results. The case went cold, but one tenacious detective made it a point of duty to keep up with the investigation after years of questioning Pamela's apparent death. With a little assistance from a true crime television program, the case was reopened. Today's case takes us to the small town of Coero, Texas, which was shaken by the death of Pamela Shelley. Pamela Jean Shelley was born on the 25th of July, 1969 in Houston, Texas, but she was raised in the quaint community of Ashdown, Arkansas, which had a population of 4,500 at the time. Pamela comes from a family that worked hard. Her mother worked at a nursing facility while her father drove a truck for lodging. She also had a brother and a sister. Pamela Shelley was described as being extremely kind and outgoing with everyone around her. When Pamela Shelley was 16 years old, she met her first husband, Jesse Suggs, who was 20 years old at the time. They discussed their future plans of getting married one day. However, Pamela's father wanted her to complete high school before any other thing. So, following her high school graduation, she and Jesse got married immediately. Not long after, they became parents, giving birth to Kayla, their first child and daughter. Just four years into their marriage, Pamela and Jesse began to have problems. Jesse frequently used narcotics to get high, and eventually his drug problems caused him to lead a life of crime. Pamela and Jesse had an on and off relationship for a while before finally getting a divorce. In the summer of 1991, Pamela Shelley got married to another man by the name of Gary. They conceived a child they named Dustin. The marriage lasted just a year, after which she briefly moved back in with Jesse, her ex-husband before finally moving in with her parents. Some years later, Pamela Shelley reconnected with Ronnie Hendricks, a childhood acquaintance. She and Ronnie always seemed to click, but they hadn't spoken in over a decade. After they rekindled their relationship, Ronnie proposed to her and invited her and the kids to come live with him in Cuero, Texas, to which Pamela agreed. In the summer of 2000, she and her son, Dustin alongside Ronnie, then traveled to Cuero by care for eight hours. Pamela's daughter, 
Kayla was to join them few months later. The family of Ronnie Hendricks resided in Cuero, Texas. According to Ronnie's mother, Deborah, everything was going well with them until Kayla moved in. She said, Kayla altered the entire dynamic in the house, making her son Ronnie to frequently get into an argument with her because he would always push her to assist around the house. Deborah and Ronnie claimed that Kayla also insisted on her and her mother returning to Arkansas so she could be with her father. Ronnie and Pamela became at odds virtually every day until horror struck on the 6th of January 2001. Ronnie Hendrick claimed he was on the porch of their home on the 6th of January 2001 when he heard a gunshot from inside. At exactly 5 o'clock, he dialed 911 and not long. The DeWitt County Police arrived the scene. On getting inside, the police and the EMTs found Pamela Shelley unresponsive on the bathroom floor. Her right temple had been shot, the gun was on the counter, and there was blood all over. Ronnie Hendrick was informed by the EMTs that it would take them an hour to reach the closest hospital. Ronnie promised to accompany them and said he knew how to get there more quickly by taking the back roads. Pamela wasn't in a good state, but she was still alive. However, she was declared brain dead in the hospital on January 7 after being put on life support. Jesse, Pamela's ex-husband, arrived at the hospital and picked up the kids to take them back to Arkansas. The medical examiner determined that Pamela's death was a suicide on January 8, 2001. Given that the gunshot wound made very close contact with the skin, it was established that it was self-inflicted. However, Sheriff Carl Bowen, who was placed in charge of the case, rejected the suicide theory. Sheriff Bowen had a conversation with Jesse Suggs, who confessed that he and Pamela's relationship was quite rough because he couldn't get his act right. When asked when he last saw Pamela, Jesse said they had both shared a bed the night before she went for Texas. He further explained that Pamela had intended to return with his children on January 6, and that he had traveled to Texas to bring them back to Arkansas. Jesse was aware of Ronnie, Pamela, and Kayla's constant issues. As part of the investigation, Jesse agreed to take a polygraph, which he successfully passed. Since Pamela Shelley was shot when Jesse was 800 miles away in Arkansas at his mother's house, he was ruled out as a suspect. The next person the investigators had a chat with was Ronnie Hendrick. He told the police that he had been outside on the porch when he heard what appeared to be a gunshot. He then rushed inside and discovered Pamela lying on the floor, bleeding from a head wound. He claimed to have protected 12-year-old Kayla and 9-year-old Dustin from the gruesome scene. Ronnie further acknowledged that Pamela and the kids had packed up their belongings that morning, preparing to return to Arkansas. According to him, Pamela Shelley had been depressed over going back to Arkansas. However, the relocation was compelled by family matters, particularly because of the discord between him and Kayla. Ronnie told the police that Pamela didn't want to return, but had to since she was afraid of losing her children. Despite the autopsy results, the investigators were bothered with the case contradictions. They wondered why Pamela Shelley packed her whole belongings into a car if she wanted to kill herself. Additionally, Ronnie Hendrick's portrayal of a young woman intent on suicide didn't line up with what authorities knew about Pamela Shelley. According to Sheriff Carl Bowen, a former deputy with the DeWitt County Sheriff's Office, Pamela Shelley's death may have been the result of an accident or homicide. In order to find answers, officials requested that Ronnie Hendrick undergo a polygraph test, to which he agreed, but failed to show up for three different appointments. He either postponed or simply failed to show up before completely disappearing. The investigation was concluded and the case went cold after the medical examiner determined that suicide was the cause of death. However, seven years after Pamela Shelley's passing, Sheriff Carl Bowen decided to re-examine the case because he had never believed it was a suicide. The medical examiner nevertheless was still certain that Pamela's autopsy result was correct. Regardless, Sheriff Carl Bowen retrieved Pamela's medical records for a proper and thorough examination. It was discovered that Pamela Shelley often suffered from stress-induced seizures 
and she was taking a low-grade antidepressants for it. Sheriff Bowen had a conversation with Kyla, who confessed that Ronnie allegedly attacked her on January 4, two days before her mother was found dead. According to Kayla, Ronnie then attacked her mother and blackened her eyes so bad when she defended her from him. They later visited a hospital. Pamela and the children decided that they would inform the medical professionals that Pamela had fallen into a coffee table. After the incident, Pamela made the decision to take the children back to Arkansas on January 6, since that was what they genuinely wanted. After this revelation, in 2008, Sheriff Carl Bowen tracked down Ronnie Hendrick at the county jail. Ronnie had been taken into custody after hitting his girlfriend. He was then asked to retell the incident that occurred on the 6th of January 2001. The police noticed inconsistencies with his stories. He was also asked to take a polygraph exam, which revealed that he was being deceptive. The investigators knew something was fishy, but they didn't have enough evidence to prosecute Ronnie for Pamela's murder. The case, however, went cold again until four years later in 2012, when a TV show that investigated cold cases chose to look at Pamela Shelley's case. They sought to examine the gun for DNA and fingerprints. The revelation of the results was startling. Despite the fact that the gun was Ronnie's, neither Pamela nor Ronnie's DNA was found on it. Now, the police and TV program thought the pistol had been cleaned of any form of DNA. At this point, Sheriff Carl Bowen was getting assured that Pamela didn't commit suicide. In August 2012, he went ahead to have a second conversation with Pamela's ex-husband, Jesse Suggs, and his mother, Shirley. Shirley admitted to the sheriff that when Pamela was in Curo, Texas, she and Jesse had secretly been communicating with a burner phone. When asked if she believed Pamela had killed herself, Shirley declared that she believed Ronnie Hendricks was the one who had shot her. According to Jesse Suggs, he and Pamela had a phone conversation just 30 minutes before she was shot. He claimed to have heard Ronnie enter the room, grab the phone, and told Jesse that the only way Pamela would be returning home to Arkansas was in a pine box. These revelations were becoming shocking, and a motive was established. The detectives had what they needed to go to a grand jury. The medical examiner soon changed Pamela Shelley's cause of death from suicide to undetermined after learning about Ronnie Hendrick's abuse towards Pamela, Kyla, and other women he had dated. This development is coming 11 years after Pamela Shelley had passed away. In the fall of 2012, Ronnie Hendrick was charged with Pamela Shelley's murder. Finally, 12 years after Pamela's death, Ronnie pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 22 years in prison. 